Um, this is why I moved the exam up in front of Chapter 5, because Chapter 5 has a lot of fairly difficult or interesting material. <clears throat> Before we talk about um, balancing and moles and whatever, next um, Wednesday we are going to do a lab, um, a conductivity lab. Now, <clears throat> it's a fairly simple lab. I have a handout for you, and I was um, planning on handing it out. But the uh, copier ate literally and uh, jammed itself in the process, so uh, I couldn't do that. But I will have a handout for you on Wednesday explaining the lab, the procedures, and whatever. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, what we're going to be looking at are what are called electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Uh, when an ionic compound and some molecular compounds dissolve in water, they dissociate to form ions. So <clears throat> these ions are solvated in the water. And one of the uh, consequences of that is that once you form ions in solution, that solution conducts electricity. Now, depending upon how highly ionized something is, it will conduct it more or less or whatever. This is the little conductivity meter you're going to be using. Um, <clears throat> got nothing fancy. It's got a battery, a little bit of logic, and two LEDs, a red and a green. Um, depending upon how strongly ionized something is, they will glow differently. <clears throat> this one, for example, the red and the green are both glowing very brightly. Um, this is a strong electrolyte, lots of ions in solution. Um, this one, the red is barely glowing, the green isn't. This is a very weak electrolyte, so not many ions in solution at all. The kinds of things we're going to be looking at, um, classic one, take an ionic solid like sodium chloride. Again, when it hits water, it separates into sodium and chloride ions. Molecular compound, HCl is a molecular compound with a covalent bond there. However, in the presence of water, <coughs> this bond between the hydrogen and the fluorine splits and we form hydronium ion and chloride anion. This is another example of a very strong electrolyte, actually. This is sugar, C12H22O11. It's a molecular compound, but when it goes into water, it does not ionize. So it is a non-electrolyte. It just goes into water and just sits there. Um, so what we'll do is we'll look at an assortment of compounds, and you will record the intensity of the two lights and decide which ones are strong electrolytes and which ones are weak. Wednesday. All right, let's start off with chemical reactions, balancing, and stuff like that. We've talked about chemical reactions, basically a chemical reaction describes a chemical change. Um, here we have aluminum reacting with bromine. We've seen this before. And we form aluminum bromide as a product. <clears throat> we use a reaction arrow when we write a chemical equation. Uh, the arrow links the reactants and the products. And the arrow here has the same properties as an equal sign. Now what that really means is that there must be the same numbers and types of atoms on both sides of the equation. So if you look at this equation, you see we have two aluminums here, two aluminums here. We have a total of six bromines and a total of two times three, six bromines same numbers and types on both sides. Also, uh, you must have the same mass on both sides. But we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> the little letters down here, um, S, L, 
in another S, G, uh, A, Q, those represent the state. Um, S is a solid, L is a liquid, G is a gas, A, Q means it's an aqueous solution. So it's dissolved in water. <coughs> in order to make sure we have the same numbers and types of atoms on both sides, we put these little coefficients in. So here's a two, here's a three, here's a two. These coefficients um, define the stoichiometry of the reaction. Stoichiometry is a wonderful word. Um, you can go home and tell everybody, yeah, we talked about stoichiometry today, and make your team really supply really with it. Um, but actually, it's nothing more than inserting the coefficients properly so that we have the same numbers and types of atoms. <clears throat> Again, we have two aluminums, six bromines, and we have two of the compound aluminum bromide. The numbers we put in here are our coefficients. Now, the process of putting in those coefficients is the act of balancing an equation. Um, there are lots and lots of ways to balance equations. Um, <clears throat> there's even a computer algorithm that will do it for you. Um, probably, I think, for especially for this course, the simplest way to do it is just by inspection. Um, by inspection, there are some, some ways that you can approach it. What I tend to do is I look at reactants and products and look for atoms that are even on one side and odd on the other, or the other way around. So let's look at this. This is decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. It forms oxygen and water. Now right away you should note that this is not a balanced equation. We do have two hydrogens on both sides. But we have two oxygens here, and we have a total of three on this side. So let's not balance. The strategy that you want to do is to look and say, what can I do, what coefficient can I put in to, first of all, fix the odd-even problem? So we want to make oxygens even on both sides. Now, the simplest way to do it, since water only has one oxygen, <coughs> would be to stick a coefficient of two in front of the water. When we do this, we now have two oxygens and two oxygens. Two on this side, they're different, but at least they're both even. Next, you want to take and uh, see what you've done by sticking in this factor of two. We have four hydrogens here, but we only have two on this side. So to fix that, we want to stick in a two in front of our peroxide. Now, let's see where we are. Now we have four hydrogens here. We have four hydrogens here. Four oxygens, one, two, three, four oxygens. This equation is balanced. So basically you want to look for odd evens. Simple way to do it. Look for odd evens, fix it, and then adjust, see, see what happened after you fix it and just keep putting in coefficients if you have to until you finally get there. Go ahead and take this sentence and convert it into a chemical equation. Potassium chlorate, you remember, I'm sure, that chlorate is ClO3. The 
potassium, of course, is a K. Chlorine is a minus one, potassium is plus one. So that's just KClO3. We're going to decompose and make O2 and potassium fluoride. So the basic equation would look like this. Now as you look at this, once again, I want you to realize this is not balanced, is it? We have one potassium, one potassium, one chlorine, one chlorine, but three oxygens and only two. So the odd even approach would be to say, well, what do we have to do to make this an even number? And that's simply sticking in the coefficient two in front of it. When we do that, there it goes, we now have six total oxygens, right? But only two on this side. So in order to make six oxygens, we need to stick a three in. So you do one side, you gotta do, what you do, so one side you gotta do the other side? Yeah, when you look and you see what kind of mess you made. You got to equal out, right? Yep. Now, <clears throat> the oxygen are balanced. That's fine. But now we have two potassiums here, one here, and two chlorines here, only one here. But we can fix that simply by sticking in a two. And now, the equation's balanced. Oops. Now the equation is balanced. Same numbers in type on both sides. Now, this particular reaction is a useful little reaction in a lab because sometimes you want a source, an easy source of oxygen. You can take potassium chlorate, warm it up, and it will generate oxygen. This is an example of that happening. So again, we're taking our KClO3, getting oxygen and KCl. This guy is a gummy bear. Now, gummy bear is essentially pure sugar. So this is sugar. Here's our KClO3, make the KCl, CO2, and water. Um, this equation is also not balanced, is it? If you look at it here, we have six carbons, only one CO2. We have 12 hydrogens, only two on this side. But we can fix that easily just by doing this. And now we're going to take our little guy and drop him into the KClO3. Now what's happening here? As the KClO3 decomposes, it makes oxygen. <clears throat> Gummy bear is sugar. It reacts with the oxygen. As soon as it forms, it forms carbon dioxide and water. This is a video you show to small children, or anyone that really likes gummy bears. But it's a very nice illustration of an oxidation reaction. Any questions? All right, let's look at some examples. I have one. Yeah. How did they do that? How did they do that? How did they do this? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we have a test tube that will show you in a second, mm -hmm. and that is KClO3 that's been heated up till it's molten. And as it does that, it's starting to evolve oxygen. Then you drop the little gummy bear in. As soon as it hits the hot KClO3 and the rich oxygen there, you see it bubbling a little bit, it just goes off like a rocket.
Well, we're going to do some examples now. So let's do those. And really, the only way to learn to balance equations is just to do it. So let's just do it. Look at our first one here. <clears throat> now, this board is supposed to be magic and be able to be written on, but it doesn't work. I'm going to try it the old-fashioned way and hope we can get it off. If we look at our first one here, <clears throat> we have uh, two nitrogens here, one nitrogen on this side, right? Um, we have two hydrogens and three hydrogens. Now we could make them both even here simply by doing what? Sticking in a coefficient of two in front of our ammonia. Right, so we did that. Now we have even hydrogens on both sides. Even nitrogens on both sides. Our nitrogens are fine. We have two here, we have two here. But this is a total of six, isn't it? Yes. We only have two. So what do we need? Two. Well, we need three of them. So, yeah? Why did you choose two? Well, because we have an odd number. If we multiply it by two, it'll be even. Well, why wouldn't you choose, you know, say... Well, your coefficients you want, just like in a formula, you want the lowest whole number ratio that you can get. So two is a good place to start. All right, so let's see if it worked. And here's the answer. Three hydrogens, one molecular nitrogen gives us two ammonias. Look at this next one. See if you can figure out what you have to do to fix the odd even on the hydrogen. So we're on the second one then I said? Mm -hmm. we're on the second one here? On the second one here. We have one hydrogen over there, we have two hydrogens here, right? We have, what, that's eight, isn't it? We have two. This is an H. So if we put a two in front of it here, now we have two hydrogens, that's even, two hydrogens here. One zinc, one zinc. But this also gave us two chlorines, didn't it? But that's good because we need two on this side. So, only coefficient we have to put in here is a two in front of the HCl. Look at your next one to see if you can fix it. We have three oxygens here, don't we? Two on this side, so this is our odd side. So let's fix that, first of all, by putting a two in front to give us a total of six oxygens. Now if we go to the other side, we're going to need six oxygens, aren't we? So that's going to be three O2s. Now look at the iron. We have two times two, four irons on this side, don't we? Only one on this side. So we're going to have to stick a four in here, aren't we? Now, finally, how many CO2s do we need to balance it? How 
many chlorines on this side? Four times three is 12. So how many Cl2s do we need? Six. Let's see if this stuff comes off of here. Yeah, sort of. Not great, but sort of. Any question on these? Let's do it on the set. Well, this gets to be really fun. It's like the crossword puzzle or something. Our problem in the first one here is our hydrogens again, isn't it? We have two on this side and three on this side. The simplest way to do it would be to stick a 2 in in front of the sodium hydroxide. So now at least we're even on both sides. Now, we have four hydrogens here. So that's one, two, three, four. Only two on this side. And we have two sodiums, right? So we're going to need to put a 2 over here. Sodium works now. <clears throat> this gave us two oxygens. But we have one on this side. So we need another 2. So this gives us four total hydrogens. One, two, three, four hydrogens two sodiums, and two oxygens. And I got it right. Go ahead to our lead. Look at our hydrogens and our chlorines. There's a problem with that. One of each on this side, two of each on this side. Simplest way to fix that, obviously, is just to double the amount of HCl, right? Now, we have one lead, one lead. Two chlorines, two chlorines. Two hydrogens, two hydrogens. And it worked. So when you see a, a problem like that, you add the two? Hmm? You know how you get like a previous question? It's, they say two plus two, but the clerk say two and two. Right. Instead of you putting a two with a chlorine in it, you just add the two in the middle. Why won't you put the other two? Well, here? Yeah. Well, I mean, this says the same thing. This is two chlorines, and CO2 means this compound is two chlorines. So we're just reading the formula, reading the atoms in the formula. All right, our last one. Let's see. One silver, one silver, that's good. We have one nitrate on this side, but two on this side, right? So 
So let's fix that. We need two nitrates on this side. So we can do that just by putting a two here in front of our silver nitrate. So now we have two nitrates, those guys. And we're going to need two silvers on this side. So I'm going to stick a two here in front of my silver chloride. And let's see where we are now. Two silvers, two silvers, two nitrates, two nitrates, one magnesium, one magnesium, two chlorines, two chlorines. My gosh, it's balanced too. Now the only way to do this, like I said, the only way to get good at it is just to practice. And in this course, when we say practice, what does that mean? It means that we have a tutorial. In the tutorial, you will be given an equation um, in front of each reactant or product, uh, there's a little uh, place to enter text. Now, the one thing you have to do here that you don't do in a regular equation is if the coefficient for one of these guys is 1. When we write a regular equation, we leave that out. We don't put the 1 in, right? But on the tutorial, if it's 1, you must stick in the number 1. So quickly, let's do this. This is ethene. It's an organic compound. Reacts with oxygen to get CO2 and water. Let's start off with the carbons. We have two carbons here, but only one on this side. So what will we do? Stick in a carbon. So here's our two. <coughs> Here we have one, two, three, four hydrogens, but only two on this side. So what do we have to put in? Another two. Now, how many oxygens do we need? How many on this side? <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, six. Oxygen comes as O2, we need six of them, so that's a three. Now on the tutorial, you'd also have to put a one in front of the ethene. We're not going to do that because that would look ugly. Let's do one more. This is calcium carbide. Calcium carbide, when it hits water, um, evolves acetylene gas. Acetylene gas is what you use in a uh, blowtorch for welding. Um, acetylene gas, again, would react with oxygen, blah, blah, blah. But this is just the, the equation to get our acetylene. We have one calcium, one calcium. That's good. We have two carbons and two carbons. We're still fine. However, we have two waters here, and, or two hydrogens. How many hydrogens on this side? One, two, three, four. So, <clears throat> only two here, four on this side. We need to put a two in here. Now that gives us two, uh, two oxygens, and we need two oxygens for our hydroxide. Once again, on the tutorial, you'd have to put a one in there, a one, and a one. Don't forget to do that. It'll tell you you're wrong. Any questions?
So we're going to put a one, 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 number yep. two. Add that two. Number two. Yeah. All right. I um, I think it's up on Blackboard, but there's a worksheet called Balancing Equations, um, which you can practice on. I think there's like 30 or 40 on the sheet. Um, and of course, you can do tutorials and get credit for it. So practice. That's the only way you really get good at this. All right, let's move on to the mole concept. That's a mole. And this guy that's slowly appearing is the star of the mole concept. This is Avogadro. <clears throat> We've talked about atoms. We know that in a single copper penny, you would have roughly 28, 6 billion atoms. That's a big number. Um, quite often in chemistry, we need to use very large numbers, talk about large number of atoms or molecules or whatever. And so chemists have developed this concept of a mole. A mole is nothing more than a unit describing 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. Now that's a huge number. That's a huge number. But this is defined as a mole. Now, this odd number came about um, <clears throat> some work that Avogadro did with gases. Um, what he, well, what he suggested originally was that equal volumes of any gas contain the same number of particles. Now, that's a hard concept to swallow, but it's true. And when we do the gas laws, we'll talk more about that too. Further, if you took 22.4 liters of any gas, any gas, any pure gas, the mass of that gas, the 22.4 liters of it, was identical with the formula mass of whatever your gas was. So CO2, um, the formula weight is 44 grams. If you have 22.4 liters of CO2, it weighs 44 grams. Amazing concept. This number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, is Avogadro's number. And in your 22.4 liters, this is how many gas particles you have. <clears throat> if we take any substance, Actually, it doesn't have to be a gas at all. With the mass of the substance equal to its formula mass, that also contains one mole of particles. This is called the molar mass. The mass of one mole of particles. Today is defined as 12 grams of carbon-12. The isotope carbon-12, we talked about that, that's the common one. The molar mass of this is 12. The average atomic mass of carbon is 12.01, if you look at your periodic table. This is the molar mass of carbon. The definition today of a mole is any amount of substance that contains as many particles as exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. But this is a very, very useful, very important concept in chemistry because it's going to allow us to link the number of particles and the mass of the particle. When we do reactions, we know that there are so many atoms of this going to react with so many atoms of that. We express that in terms of moles. Now, grams, and this is one mole of atoms in your hand. 
phenomenal how small atoms are, and uh, you know, mole is just a tremendously large number. All right, let's do one more concept here, and this is molar mass and molecular weight. We talked about this earlier. When we speak of molecular weight, we're talking about the weight of a compound. Um, it's actually given in atomic mass units, but nobody ever does that. <clears throat> For example, glycine, what we just saw, has two carbons, five hydrogens, a nitrogen, and two oxygens. So if we wanted to add up the molecular weight, we would go to the periodic table. Every carbon weighs 12.01. Every hydrogen is 1.008. Nitrogen, 14. Oxygen, 16. So this is what we would have. Two carbons, five hydrogens, one nitrogen, and two oxygens. Simply multiply it out, add it up, and it comes to 75.07. If we had 75.07 grams of glycine, we would have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd glycine molecules. Molar mass is defined as our molecular weight here, but we simply express it as grams per mole. Now, the mole concept is really, really interesting and important. Um, this balloon here contains 32 grams of oxygen. Oxygen weighs 16. There are two oxygen because it's O2. This is one mole of oxygen. This little lump of copper is 63 grams. That's one mole of copper. 18 grams of water is one mole of water. 100 grams of calcium carbonate, one mole. Each of these samples contains the same numbers of particles. And this is how we're going to be able to design reactions so that, well, for example, if we needed one mole of copper, one mole of O2 to make copper two oxide, we would take 63 grams, 32 grams, and that would do our reaction. Another way to look at it, think of a mole as just a very large number, but it's no different than the word dozen. Okay, a dozen has 12. We're all familiar with a dozen, 12 things. A mole simply has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. You can have a mole of atoms, a mole of a compound, a mole of pigs, a mole of chickens, whatever. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. So let's do a couple silly problems here first. Let's say we had 66 dozen four-legged dogs. Okay? 66 dozen four-legged dogs. How many legs? Well, we would look at this and say, <clears throat> we're going to set up a series of proportions. Our given here is going to be our 66 dozen, and we're going to stick in some ratios. For a dozen, we know that there are 12 things in a dozen, so we'll stick that in there. We know that for every dog, by definition, we have four legs. So the way we would do this, we'd start off with our given, 66 dozen dogs. We know that there are 12 things in every dozen, and there are four legs in every dog. We know we set up our ratios right because they cancel. Dozens and dogs cancel. All we're left with is legs. Math is simple, 66 times 12 times 4, 3168 legs. Now 
Now, I want you to look at this and realize that we stuck this 12 things in a dozen in here. Because let's do the same thing now with moles. How about 66 moles of four-legged dogs? Going to do it exactly the same way, but instead of 12 things per dozen, we're going to do 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things per mole. So we start off with our given. We know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things in a mole, and that there are four legs per dog. Once again, moles are going to cancel now, dogs are going to cancel, and we're just left with legs. Now, once again, this is why I want you to make sure that you know how to use your calculator. Because 66 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd times 4 is 1.59 times 10 to the 26 legs. We'll down that. Yeah? Where does it come from? That's Avogadro's number. That's the number of things in a mole. Like 12 in a dozen, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd in a mole, right? All right. Look at this little problem. It's a simple one. <clears throat> A mole of hydrogen gas contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen molecules, right? How many molecules in half a mole? Once again, we know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of hydrogen in one mole. We are given that we have half a mole. So let's just set up our ratios. <coughs> Here we have half a mole. We know, again, that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in a mole. Moles cancel, and we're left only with molecules. Do our math, 0.5 times this, only going to work on the coefficient, not the exponent, and we have 3.01 times 10 to the 20. Any questions on this? Here we have 3.27 times 10 to the minus 9 moles. How many gas particles are there? Well, how many gas particles in one mole? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, right? So once again, let's just set up a simple ratio. Our number of moles here is our given. We know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles per mole. So we can just write it this way. <clears throat> we have 10 to the minus 9 moles. We know that there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles in one mole. Moles cancel, and we're left with particles. I did this on purpose. Um, you will see moles written out as moles with an S on the end. Um, the S is quite often dropped or abbreviated as MOL. They're all the same thing. 
<coughs> Once again, the first tutorial that we ever did, multiplying big numbers on your calculator. We do this, and we wind up with 1.97 times 10 to the 15 particles. This is an old test question. Magnesium hydroxide, <coughs> milk of magnesium it's called. We have 17.8 grams of it. If you go to the periodic table and take the weight of magnesium, oxygen, and hydrogen, <coughs> add them all up, the molar mass here <coughs> is 58. 0.32 grams per mole. <coughs> All right, so how many moles is 17.8 grams? <coughs> what we're doing, we're given a mass, and we know the molar mass. Now the molar mass, we can actually use as a ratio because grams per mole can also be written as grams over one mole. So our given here would be our mass. Our ratio would be 58.232 grams over one mole. The grams has to be in the denominator. <coughs> our grams are going to cancel. And our simple math, <coughs> our mass divided by our molar mass gives us 0.305 moles. Now what I just said is very important. We'll come back to this many times. This is mass divided by molar mass is moles. Remember that. Say that before you go to bed at night. Mass over molar mass is moles. <clears throat> Another very simple one here. A mole contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. What's a tenth of a mole? Remember we talked about using ratios, using percentages as ratios. 10% is really 10 over 100, isn't it? That's what 10% means. So, we could take the number of molecules in the mole, a ratio of 10%, no units here, so we just have molecules, multiply this out, and we have 6.02 times 10 to the 22nd. Now you can do that in your head because 10% is 0.1, so our exponent simply drops by 1. <clears throat> so which of these is the correct answer? We need 10 to the 22nd, don't we? <clears throat> but it's not 1 to the 22nd. Not 0 0.6 to the 22nd. In fact, none of them match. Now, I've said many times here, and the little silly movie <coughs> said it also, just how large a mole is. I have one more little video clip here to show you to demonstrate just how big 10 to the 23rd really is. <clears throat> We're going to start off looking at a leaf. Okay, so we're just sitting here right over the leaf. What we're going to do is move back a power of 10 
every time. <clears throat> so we're going to move back one meter, 10 meters, 100 meters, until we get to 10 to the 23rd meters. So we start off with our leap. Move back. We are one meter away, 10 meters away. <clears throat> we are 1,000 meters away, 100,000 meters away. Now we can see we're in northern Florida. <clears throat> 10 to the 8th meters, there's the Earth. That's the moon. This is representing our orbit. Here's our orbit. There's our solar system. We are now at 10 to the 14th. That's our solar system. 10 to the 15th is just a little blob. And by the time we hit 10 to the 17th, it's gone. We're moving out into the Milky Way now. You can see lots of stars, start to see the arms, at 10 to the 23rd meters above that leap, that's the Milky Way. It's a phenomenal large number. Yeah? What's taking those pictures? Hmm? What's taking those pictures? Oh, they're all computer generated. So those, these are just estimates <clears throat> of right. how it But it is, it just really drives home just what a big number 10 to the 23rd really is. All right, tutorial time. <clears throat> this is a very simple tutorial. You are simply given one of these things and you have to fill in the missing. The missing. <clears throat> Here we are given moles and mass. We have to calculate the molar mass. Now, molar mass, remember, is nothing more than mass or grams divided by the number of moles. So here we have grams and moles. By definition, molar mass is grams divided by moles. Molar mass is mass divided by moles. So here we plug in our mass of 104, our moles 1.03, and we get 100 grams per mole. Let's do another one. Here I give you the molar mass, I give you the moles. What does this stuff weigh? Remember, molar mass is mass divided by moles. <clears throat> so mass is simply going to be moles multiplied by the molar mass. So we take our number of moles, 0.88. Our molar mass is 186. Multiply them together, that gives us 163. Another tutorial for moles called mole mass conversions. <clears throat> Here we're simply given it in a word problem. We are given that we have 87.36 grams of copper. Now the molar mass of copper is 63.5. How many moles is this? Exactly like you did on the previous one. Moles is going to be mass divided by molar mass. I told you to remember that one, right? Mass divided by molar mass gives you moles. So we're going to simply take our mass, 87 divided by 63, and that's 1.38 moles. Here, we 
want to know the mass. We are given a certain number of moles of lead. One mole of lead weighs 82 grams. Take your same basic equation. Moles divided by or mass divided by moles is molar mass. Therefore, mass is moles multiplied by molar mass. So we're going to multiply 0.243 times 82, and that's 19.9 grams. This tutorial also does something cute. It lets you use your periodic table to identify an element based on its molar mass. Okay, so what you do in this is we're going to calculate a molar mass. Then we're going to look at our periodic table and pick out something that matches. So we are given a mass and we are given moles. Grams divided by moles is molar mass, isn't it? So we simply divide mass divided by moles. That's going to give us our molar mass. In this case, that's 10.8 grams. Now, remember, molar mass is the average mass that you see on the periodic table. So it's these little numbers down here, carbon 4.01, etc., etc. So what we do is we simply need to match up, look at our periodic table, and we're looking for something with a molar mass of 10.8. Looks to me like... Boron got it. So on the tutorial, what you do is you simply, whoops, you simply type B into the slot. Any We're going to use the mole concept now to allow us to do a percentage composition by mass for a compound. The way we're going to be able to do this is to look at a mole ratio. Okay? If we looked at HCl, if we had one mole of HCl, how many moles of H would we have? One. How many moles of chlorine would we have? One. Right? So I can say that if we had one mole of HCl, it would have one mole of hydrogen in it. Everyone agree with that? Well, we also know that one mole of hydrogen weighs 1.008 grams. And we can add up a molar mass here for HCl. So we could say this is the same thing as one mole, and this is the same thing as one mole of HCl. That's the molar mass of HCl. So let's just take this and do the math. Let's divide 1 by our 35.5. When we do that, we get 0.0284. Now that's the fraction we get. Remember, when we want to convert a fraction into a percentage, we just multiply by 100. So, 0.0284 is the same as 2.84%.
So what we can say is that HCL is 2.84% opposition. The percentage opposition. Now let's look at a couple examples here. Calcium fluoride, one calcium, two fluorines. What's the percentage of fluorine? Well, <clears throat> molar mass of fluorine on the periodic table is 19 grams per mole. If we add up calcium fluoride, we get a molar mass of 78. And that's just adding up the calcium and two fluorines. So, we're going to set up a simple ratio. We know that in calcium fluoride, there are two moles of fluorine for every calcium fluoride. Two to one. CAF2, two, two to one. Now we know that every fluorine weighs 19, right? We have two of them. So we simply say two times 19, that's for our two fluorines, and this is the molar mass of calcium fluoride. So once again, we do our simple math here. 2 times 19 divided by 78 is 0.4867, or as a percentage, fluorine is 48.67% of the mass of calcium fluoride. Any questions? <clears throat> Let's do another one. We have two fluorines, so we have to multiply 19 by 2. And then we divide by our 78. What is this stuff? Well, it's scandium. <clears throat> What's the charge on scandium? Well, fluorine is a minus one. We have three of them. So this must be scandium three fluorine. And its molar mass is 295.3. So, What's our percentage of oxygen? How many oxygens are in one mole of this cell? Every chlorate has three of them, doesn't it? And we have three chlorates. So three times three is nine oxygens. We have nine oxygens, and each of them weighs 16. So we would write it this way. Nine moles of oxygen for every mole of this stuff. Simply three times three. So we're going to multiply our 16 here by nine and then divide by the molar mass of our compound. Now I can't do this one in my head, but nine times 16 divided by 295, 0.488 or 48.8%. Any questions? Now, of course, there's a tutorial for this, too. 
Of course there is. This is going to become your favorite tutorial, brother, because once you get the hang of it, you can just fly through these things, and you'll say to yourself, gee, yeah, I hope there's a lot of this on the exam. Got it? <clears throat> Here we have nickel to hypochlorite. We want the mass percent for every component element. All right. This stuff weighs 161, doesn't it? Nitrogen weighs, I'm sorry, nickel weighs 58.69. How many of them are there? Just one. So, for our nickel, we would take its molar mass, divided by the total mass here, multiply by 100, and we're at 36.3%. How many chlorines are in here? Two. There are two hypochlorites, that's two chlorines. So for chlorine, we're going to multiply our 35 by 2 and divide by 161. And we get 43.9%. How many oxygens? Well, there's one per hypochlorite, so there are two of them. So 16 times 2 divided by 161 19.8%. Now, the way the program rounds, these don't always add up to exactly 100. I apologize, but it's close enough. Yeah? This will show up on, say, you give any single number and incorrect it. It'll show you the three. Yep, it'll show you the answer. I'm going to do one more here. I'll hush, let you calculate these numbers. This is calcium chloride, and it weighs 175. Mm -hmm. Calcium weighs 40. There's only one of them. For calcium, you would take your 40, divide by 175, and that's 22.9%. Yes. Yep. It's, well, we'll do this for chlorine now. What's the hundred? Oh, that's to make it a percentage. Chlorine, how many chlorines are in the compound here? So, we're going to multiply 35.5 times 2, divide by 175, and we're at 40.5%. And oxygen, how many oxygens here? 2 times 2 is 4. So 4 times 16 divided by 175, 36.6%. Once again, it's a simple tutorial once you grasp the concept. And it will soon be your favorite, I assure you. It always is. Any questions? All right, going to move forward here to a concept that's known as molarity. <clears throat> molarity, very, very simply, is the number of moles of something in solution divided by the liters of solution. Number of moles 
divided by the leaves. This is a volumetric flask. It's etched with a little line that's exactly one liter. And this is one mole per liter in it. All right. The concept of molarity allows us to do reactions in solution because we will know exactly how many moles of something we have in a given volume. Molarity is abbreviated with an uppercase L. Now, it's important that you remember that because when you get to general chemistry, if you do, lowercase m represents molality. I know that's cool, but they're different. And so, get in the habit of making this an uppercase m for molarity. Molarity is simply defined as the number of moles of solute, that's the stuff that's dissolved, divided by the volume in liters. Again, it's moles per liter. Now, how do you make a solution of non-molarity? What you do is you take an empty volumetric flask, like the one we saw, and remember it has a little fine etching there. When you fill up to that point, that's exactly one liter. So we start off with an empty flask. We're now going to go to our balance and we're going to weigh out a certain amount of our substance. And we're going to carefully put it in our flask. So since we <clears throat> weigh this stuff out, we know its mass. We know what it is, so we know its molar mass. So we know the number of moles we put in here. Now we simply take and we add water until we get to the one liter mark. Now we know our volume, one liter. <clears throat> we know the number of moles we put in. Therefore, we know the molarity. Moles per liter. Let's look at a simple problem. <clears throat> We have 3.2 grams of sodium bromide. <clears throat> the molar mass of sodium bromide is 102. Now, we have this in 1,250 mils of solution. What is the molarity? Well, what we have to do is figure out how many moles of sodium bromide we have. Because remember, it's moles per liter. So step one, we would need to figure out the number of moles. Once we know the number of moles, we simply divide it by the number of liters. This is going to be 1.25 liters. Number of milliliter is 1 1,000. So, here we have our mass of sodium bromide divided by the molar mass of sodium bromide. Remember I said that this was one you wanted to remember? Mass divided by molar mass is moles. So we simply set up this. This is the same thing as moles. <clears throat> that gives us moles of sodium bromide. Now, we need to divide this. This is moles. We need to divide it by liters. So we'll simply divide it by 1.25 liters. Our grams will obviously cancel. Our mole will go up top because it's a reciprocal and a reciprocal. And that's going to give us the units of moles 
divided by root. We wind up with 0.0253 moles per liter. What is this in terms of molarity? All you do is change your mole per liter to your uppercase M. Uppercase M simply stands for moles per liter. Let's do a very similar problem, and I'll hush a little bit. This is sodium acetate, 82 grams per mole. We have 6.47 grams of it. And we're in 1.45 liters. What's the molarity? Go ahead and set it up. You have to calculate moles. Remember, mass over molar mass is moles. Then simply divide by liters. Our mass is 6.47 grams. Our molar mass is 82. So we simply divide them. Again, this is mass over molar mass, that's moles. Now we have this in 1400 milliliters, that's 1.45 liters. Once again, our grams will cancel. The per mole goes up top. Do our simple math, 6.47 divided by 82 divided by 1.45, and we get 0 .0544 moles per liter, or the molarity is 0 0.0544. Well, this is sodium acetate, and this is its molar mass. So if you go to the periodic table, add up a sodium, a carbon, three hydrogens, another carbon, two oxygens, you get 82. 82 grams. That's what you get from your periodic table. That's your molar mass. One mole of sodium acetate weighs 82 grams. That's the molar mass. So we simply take Mass over molar mass, this is moles, divided by liters, and we get molarity. What I'm wondering is where the chemical symbol is changed. The why? The chemical symbol. It's NaOAC in the acetate. Oh, 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 I see. Okay. <laughs> That's because writing out sodium acetate takes a lot of space. Um, Acetate, <clears throat> this is an organic chemistry shortcut. AC stands for an acetyl group. Acetyl group is a carbonyl and a CH3. So it's the first four atoms of this is an acetyl group. The abbreviation that people use for it is O for this O and then AC for the acetyl. So that's just an abbreviation. I would not ever do that to you, could I? Would I do that to you? All right. One more permutation on this. We have a solution already. It is 0.18 molar PCL. In our reaction that we want to do, we want 0.01 moles of PCL. What volume do we need? Now, I know this sounds like we're changing the rules here, but we're not. <clears throat> we need to calculate a volume 
And to do that, we're going to wind up dividing moles by our molarity. How do we know that? Just look at the math. Molarity is defined as moles divided by liter, right? Remember that one. Write it down, write it on your 3 by 5 card. Moles divided by liters. So if we're going to solve for our volume here, liters, is simply moles divided by molarity. All right, so what we want to do is take our number of moles divided by moles per liter. Moles, of course, is going to cancel. Liters is going to come up top. And we're left with liters as our unit. Simple division. We get 0 0.056 liters. Or you can express it in milliliters as 56 milliliters. That's just this time a thousand. Any questions? One more permutation that I want to do here. <clears throat> we have a solution of sucrose. C12H22O11. And we have 300 mils of it. How many sucrose molecules do we have? Now, you know, we could do that if we knew how many moles we had, right? Because we know one mole is 6.02 to the 23rd. So what we have to do is somehow calculate how many moles? <clears throat> to calculate the number of moles of sucrose, what we're going to do is take our volume and multiply it by the molarity. Go back to the same equation we had on the previous slide. Molarity is moles divided by liters, so therefore, Moles is going to be volume multiplied by molarity. This gives rise to something else that you need to remember. <clears throat> Just like mass over molar mass is moles, don't forget that one. But concentration, that's molarity, times volume is also moles. This is one that you'll use all the time, too. Yeah. Concentration is molarity. Concentration is molarity. All right, so to get our number of moles, we have our concentration here, moles per liter, times our volume, that's liters. Liters cancel, we're left just with moles. This is 0.375 moles. Now we know that every mole has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things, right? So all we have to do is multiply this times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Here's our number of moles. This is molecules per mole. Mole and per mole will cancel. Do your simple math. And we get 2.26 times 10 to the 23rd sucrose molecules. Yeah? Um, the liters. Why would they cancel out with so many times the number? <clears throat> I remember with a minus one, that's the same thing as having it in the denominator. So it would be shorter, not shorter. Yeah. yeah. We could also just draw it with a slash. Minus one is just easier sometimes. All right, of course, there's a tutorial for molarity. <clears throat> this is our simple table version. What we're given here are moles and volume, and we have to calculate molarity. Now remember, <clears throat> 
Polarity is defined as moles divided by meters. So, since we're looking for molarity here, <coughs> simply want to take our moles, divide by our liters. Here we have 0.96 moles, 0.976, and 2.15 liters. Our molarity, 0.4. Let's do another one. Here we're given molarity in moles, we want our volume. Now remember we did this, we said that our volume in liters was going to be moles divided by molarity. <clears throat> moles divided by molarity equals volume. Sometimes you will see molarity <clears throat> written a little bit funny, the uppercase M. Uh, sometimes it's just shown italic. Sometimes it's underlined. Sometimes you'll see it in books in script format. But if it's an uppercase M, that means moles per liter. So we have 0.655 moles, 0.154 mole per liter. Our moles would cancel, and we would get 4.26 liters. Let's do one more. I'll pause for a second, let you do it. <clears throat> we're given molarity, we're given volume, we need to calculate moles. Take your basic equation, molarity, moles divided by volume. And solve for moles. Moles is going to be molarity times volume. So we simply multiply 0.125 moles per liter, 2.92 liters, and we have 0.365 moles. All right, let's just lighten things up here a little bit with a fairly simple discussion of the concept of empirical formulas. We know that a chemical formula, like for glucose here, tells us the number and types of atoms we have. So we look at this and we say that's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. Around here, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six oxygens. Okay? An empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio. The lowest whole number ratio. So to get the lowest whole number ratio here, you would divide everything by six, wouldn't you? So, 6 divided by 6 is 1 carbon, 2 hydrogens, and 1 oxygen. This is acetic acid. <coughs> it has 2 carbons, 4 hydrogens, 2 oxygens. Its empirical formula is also CH2O. That's the lowest whole number ratio. Now, 
You might say, gee, that doesn't tell us a whole lot of information about our compound, does it? Why do we care? We care because when you do an analysis, if you have an unknown compound and you analyze it, what you get is the empirical formula. So that's why this is important. The other thing I want to point out, this is sugar, right? What do we refer to sugars as? They are carbohydrates, right? Look at the empirical formula. Carbon and water. Carbohydrate. That's where that comes from. And that brings us to a really neat demonstration. Sugar is carbohydrate. If you take sulfuric acid and react it with sugar, the sulfuric acid will remove the water, and you're left only with the carbon. What this guy is doing, he's adding sulfuric acid to a beaker of sugar. Now you take it and you stir it up a little bit. Sulfuric acid is nasty stuff, so you have to be careful. Slowly it starts getting black. Starts to get hot now as the reaction is going. And then suddenly, it has sucked all the water out. All that's left here is the carbon. That is a column of graphite. It's the carbon from the carbohydrate after we remove the water. Here's our equation. This is glucose in the presence of sulfuric acid. It's carbon. Sulfuric acid sucks out the water. Isn't that kind of neat? All right, look at these compounds and just jot down their empirical formulas. Remember, you want your lowest whole number ratio. Acetylene has two carbons and two hydrogens. <clears throat> the lowest whole number ratio is simply CH. It's what it looks like. It's a carbon-carbon triple bond. Next compound is benzene, C6H6. What's the lowest whole number ratio? One carbon, one hydrogen. This is what benzene looks like. Nice ring of six carbons and six hydrogens. How about water? What's the empirical formula for water? Well, this is the lowest whole number ratio, isn't it? Can't go any lower and keep them whole numbers. Finally, hydrogen peroxide. Two hydrogens, two oxygens. What is it? It's simply both. Well, this is a fine time to introduce the concept, I suppose. But these are molecular models. <clears throat> Those are actually referred to as phase going models. There are, but we use these a lot. They're nice ways to represent molecules. Let's just look at an example. <clears throat> this is what's known as a ball and stick model. For a ball and stick model, you basically have tinkerdoys with the correct bond angles, and you just stick the atoms together 
the way they are in the compound. The advantage of a ball and stick is that you can see your bonding very clearly. I say that, and you really have to stare at this. There are two bonds here. This is a double bond. These are all singles. This is a double. But you can see that if you look at the model clearly. This is a space filling model. Space filling model really tells you what this stuff looks like in real life. The um, radius of these curves is calculated for 90% of the electron power. So <clears throat> we, uh, this is what the molecule looks like in real space. The problem with the space filling, even though it does tell you what it looks like, is that it's sometimes more difficult to look at the bonding or to even see all the atoms that are put together. When you look at a molecular model, there are several things that most people adhere to. If you have a carbon atom, it's going to be either gray or black. Okay? <clears throat> Hydrogen is typically white. Oxygen is red. And nitrogen is blue. Now, after you get past that, other elements are shown, oh, sometimes with the real color that the element is. For example, fluorine is kind of a light greenish. Chlorine is a darker green. Bromine is brown. Iodine is purple. Sulfur would be yellow. So you kind of shoot for what the thing really is. Once we put this all together, like we talked about earlier, we can um, interpret these things into molecular formulas. Now remember the molecular formula expressed in mass is a molar, uh, molar mass. But this is glycine. Now you can see the double bond better. <clears throat> if we were to write glycine out, we would look at this and say we have a nitrogen, two hydrogens, two carbons. This is uh, five hydrogens total and two oxygens. This is two carbon atoms, five hydrogens, one nitrogen, and two oxygens. <clears throat> now, we can write this in terms of a molecular formula simply transferring all these things, two carbons, five hydrogens, one nitrogen, and two oxygens. This is what we refer to as a condensed molecular formula. Now, there are other ways we can show that, and later on in the class we'll talk about others, <clears throat> but this just goes for now. Again, this is how you interpret these things and hopefully you can see all of these in the uh, ball and stick model here. While we're talking about this, <clears throat> let's also address the concept of diatomic elements. Um, <clears throat> there are all oh, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven very common things that exist as diatomic. This is bromine. I said bromine is brown. And again, it's Br2. Iodine will be I2. Fluorine, Cl2. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. They're all diatomic. Now, why you need to remember these is if I tell you that we're going to react something with oxygen. When I say oxygen, you immediately think, O2. If I only wanted one O, I would say oxygen atom. But if I say oxygen, it's O2. If I say chlorine, it's Cl2. Hydrogen, H2. So make sure that you know this list, because as we do more and more reactions, we'll see these things, and it's important that we be able to recognize them.
Any questions? All right, today we have looked at some new tutorials. These are the ones that we have done today. <coughs> Balancing, mole mass, converting, calculating percent, and molarity problems. This is how they're named on the site. Once again, <coughs> do them, submit it. <coughs> you get five points per for every submission that you have added to your next exam. Now we're going to do lab on Wednesday and then we're going to go away for a week. Don't forget everything because this is a difficult concept and we're going to come back and use it over and over again in the next couple of chapters. The last part of the course is much more fun and games. We talk about earth chemistry, we talk about food, we talk about global warming, stuff like that. But we have one or two more chapters of real chemistry to get through first. And these are very important concepts because we have to use them all the time.